Sports Medicine Department. Is that right, Dr. John? And uh, now he, he went to Denver to be the head of the Olympics uh, for, the, uh, for this, the training of all these uh, athletes and, and, uh, and uh, sports guys. And so we are so privileged that he has given us a time to really uh, teach us today uh, regarding what is happening in the sports field, in the Olympics, and things like that. So before we begin, let us just offer a simple prayer. If it's okay with you, let's just uh, pause for a moment. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before your presence. We thank you, Lord, for this privilege of having Dr. Jonathan Finoff to speak for us an important topic on uh, the Olympics and the challenging times in COVID. We ask, Lord, for your wisdom and your Holy Spirit to be with us. And can you bless each one of us today? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So now... Introducing to you the one and only one, Dr. Jonathan Finoff. Okay, Dr. John. Uh, sounds good. Well, thank you, Jim, and thank you, everybody, for uh, inviting me today. Um, Melaine, for the thumbs up. I like it. <laughs> A little clap there, too. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Oh, it says that you, uh, can you undisable the participant screen sharing there, Jim? You're on mute. Hold on. I will just uh, put you as the host this time. I will put the host to you, so make you a host. Okay. okay. Now, you are, the, you are the host, so do whatever you want. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. All right. All right, can you guys see that okay? Yes, clear. Okay, good. Yes. And you can hear me, that's excellent. So I'm going to talk to you today <clears throat> about some thing that is near and dear to all of our hearts at this point, and that's that crazy little virus, coronavirus, and uh, the havoc that it has wreaked across the globe, uh, and in particular with sports. That's what I'll talk about specifically today is sports. Um, so the disclaimer is that uh, the views that I'm going to share today are going to be my views. They're not the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee's views, so uh, just take that for, for what it is. I'm on a couple of medical advisory boards and I receive royalties for some books uh, that I've written and uh, up to date, uh, but none of that is relevant to the presentation today. So I'm gonna talk to you very briefly about uh, COVID-19. All of you are very familiar with it, so I won't spend much time on it, but I will go through some timeline stuff, which is kind of interesting. Then I'll talk about uh, our initial response at the Olympic and Paralympic Committee and now what we're doing, which is planning the re-entry of uh, sports. And we'll draw some conclusions on that information. <clears throat> so as you know, uh, coronavirus is a family of viruses that causes respiratory infections in both humans and animals. And the current outbreak uh, is from the coronavirus SARS-CoV-2, which causes the infection COVID-19. Uh, and it appears that it came from bats, although they're not entirely sure about the reservoir and uh, if it did come from bats, how it went from bats into humans and so still being worked out. Um, <clears throat> so in, uh, the first case of uh, COVID-19 was, uh, or first cases, were diagnosed back in December of this uh, last year um, and it came out of the Wuhan city in China. Um, the, the actual virus was identified on January 7th and the first death was reported on January 11th of this year. In the United States, the first case didn't occur until January 20th, um, but by January 30th, the World Health Organization had declared a global public health emergency related to this because it was starting to spread uh, you know, throughout uh, Asia. By February 29th, um, which it was, it's leap year, of course. So February 29th, there were only 59 cases in the United States that had occurred cumulatively since the uh, original reporting of uh, COVID-19 and a single death had occurred at that point. 
but it rapidly evolved from there. By March 11th, you know, shortly after that February 29th date, March 11th, it was a global pandemic. By March 13th, it was a national emergency in the United States. And by the 26th, uh, the U.S. had the largest number of COVID-19 cases in the world. And at that time, that was 82,000 cases. By April 7th, uh, we, the U.S. had reported the single largest death toll on a single day of any country, and it was n over 1,900 uh, deaths that day. And COVID-19 was the leading cause, daily cause of death in the United States. Um, by May 12th, which is when I originally put this presentation together, there were 4.2 million cases worldwide with 286,000 deaths. 1.3 million cases in the United States with 80,000 deaths. And, and as of today, we've actually gone over 100,000 deaths in the United States. So certainly it has continued to increase. And just to kind of look at how fast this increase occurred, when we went from one case to 100,000 cases, it took 67 days. But to go from 100,000 to 200,000, it only took 11 days. And then from 200 to 300,000, four days, and 1 million to 2 million, 13 days. So you can see how there's just this exponential ramp up of how fast this was spreading uh, around the world. And if you go back and look at those dates in March, so remember February uh, 29th, there were only 56 cases in the United States and a single death. Uh, by March 11th, we had the global pandemic and uh, the U.S. declared the national emergency shortly thereafter. Well, I started my job as the chief medical officer for the U.S. OPC on March 2nd. So 56 cases in the U.S., not a big deal, but good grief. Within uh, two weeks, it was now a global pandemic and really hitting the U.S. hard. Uh, and by the 24th of March, the Olympic and Paralympic Games were postponed in Japan from this summer to next summer. Uh, so from a USOPC response to this, on January 30th, so well before I got there, uh, the USOPC had their first communication with the national governing bodies. National governing bodies are the small businesses of sport in each country. And so the national governing bodies in the United States, it can be uh, football and soccer and baseball and basketball and you know, lacrosse and so on and so forth. It's all of the different sports that are in the Olympics and uh, each sport has their own national governing body which runs the sport in that country. Uh, by January 31st, so the next day, uh, a working group was formed within the USOPC and initially it was only four members. But as of now, there are actually 23 members. We meet on a weekly basis and it has broad representation not only across the USOPC, but also external to the USOPC, including multiple members from the national governing bodies, uh, the Paralympic movement, three athlete representatives, and so on. So it's really diversified. And uh, part of that is to get to facilitate communication internally, but also to allow dissemination of information externally. Um, as of, remember that March 2nd is when I started. And so the one of the first major things that I did uh, was created an infectious disease advisory group. So I collected um, some individuals uh, with backgrounds in infectious disease who were running some of the uh, biocontainment units uh, around the country at very reputable institutions and also worked with a high ranking official at the CDC in order to provide us with advice as we were formulating our plans. Um, and one of the first documents I created was this workplace preparedness plan for COVID-19. So as part of that workplace preparedness, we uh, educated our staff and athletes on what COVID-19 was, what the signs and symptoms are, how to prevent infection. Um, and then we also started to disseminate this information through a communication strategy that was outlined in this document. We used posters, newsletters, webinars, social media, uh, town halls, conference calls, all sorts of different things to disseminate this information. We also shut down any tours so no public visitation on our site was uh, allowed anymore. Um, we increased our cleaning protocols using antiseptic uh, and antiviral specifically products. 
Um, so high touch areas like doorknobs and stuff at entrances to the Olympic and Paralympic training centers um, were cleaned a minimum of three times a day. We used foggers, which are these electrostatic disinfectant sprayers throughout our facilities, uh, as well as in the medical facilities. So both the training facilities and the medical facilities. We obviously put hand sanitizers everywhere and facial tissue all over the place with no touch garbage cans. We actually started having all of our staff work from home uh, that could. So, you know, our communications team, marketing team, development team, all of those people started working remotely and all non-essential travel was canceled. So we stopped sending teams over to China and Tokyo because the the, the next Olympics is in Tokyo, but the, week, the Olympics after that are in Beijing uh, in the Winter Olympics in uh, 2022. Uh, and all non-essential travel was canceled. So even domestic travel was uh, was canceled unless it was found to be mission critical. All of our staff and athletes began being screened by security and not allowed to enter the facility if they had traveled to one of the high risk uh, countries or if they had any signs or symptoms of COVID-19. Um, we also started a twice daily self-monitoring program for all of our staff. We distributed thermometers to everybody so that they could take their temperature. Face masks were given to everybody who was sick and they were sent home. Um, uh, any any uh, staff that were sick were instructed to contact their healthcare providers and athletes were instructed to contact sports medicine so that we could take care of them. And from a medical standpoint, when they would call us, uh, we would do the initial triage uh, over the phone um, and then we would go and get them uh, and bring them to our facility wearing N95 masks, gowns, gloves, face shield, standing more than six feet apart, escorting them uh, to the medical facility where we would see them in a room that was uh, designated for these types of evaluations. Um, we would uh, then complete the physical examination uh, we would do a biofire respiratory panel, which just looks for common pathogens such as influenza and other common causes of upper and lower respiratory infection. And then we would get a COVID-19 PCR test uh, done at the hospital that was next door. And pending those tests, we would quarantine the athlete on site. Uh, and we would uh, also notify anybody who had close contact with that athlete that they should self-quarantine until we got the results back. They got a negative test results, then we treated them symptomatically based on what uh, their infection was caused by, and typically the biofire would tell us what that was. And if they had a positive test, then uh, we quarantined them a minimum of 10 days. Uh, and then beyond that, they had to be asymptomatic for a minimum of 72 hours before they would be uh, released back into uh, the normal um, community of the Olympic and Paralympic training centers. And that was based on uh, the current recommendations of the Centers for Disease Control in the United States. Now we're using a uh, testing protocol where people don't get released from quarantine until they are asymptomatic, but also have two negative COVID-19 PCR tests. So we in instituted all of that. And uh, unfortunately, by March 16th, we actually had to close the Olympic and Paralympic training centers. Now, interestingly, when you close the training centers, we have a lot of athletes who live at the training centers. So while we can close the venues, so the swimming pools and the gyms and the boxing arenas and you know all of the ancillary places where people train, we couldn't actually shut down the training centers uh, from a resident standpoint because that's their home. And so if you kicked them out of their home, then they were homeless. And so we certainly weren't going to do that. And so we had a lot of athletes that chose to stay on site, but certainly plenty of people uh, decided to leave and go and stay with their families and stuff. And, and so ultimately we had uh, approximately a hundred athletes uh, and a uh, hundred staff essentially that decided to, the, the athletes stayed and staff that had to support them through the cafeteria and just security and run, running medical and so on. So from March 16th through April 23rd, uh, we only had three confirmed cases of uh, COVID-19 of athletes who were on site. And this is when you know COVID-19 was exploding in the United States. Uh, so we feel very good about the fact that we only had three cases. And uh, 
we had one case that was confirmed in an athlete that had uh, left the uh, Olympic and Paralympic Training Center, but still had access to the training center. So we ended up having to quarantine 10 additional athletes. None of them ended up testing positive. So we only had three on-site resident athletes that got uh, sick, one off-site resident athlete that got sick, and then quarantined 10 people that never uh, developed symptoms. So we felt uh, that what we initiated and how we handled our infection control procedures really minimized um, the exposure of our athletes, particularly in high density living where, you know, typically if somebody gets sick, it just goes like wildfire through it. And so we, we felt very good about that. So now we have started to refocus, you know, we, uh, everything I've talked about so far has been geared towards, you know, here's this infection, it's been identified, it spreads throughout the world. We're doing public health uh, management and gradually shutting down, you know, businesses and frankly, our entire economy. Uh, but now, you know, of course, all of the athletes and staff and, and our committee, the US Olympic and Paralympic Committee are thinking about what's next? What, when can athletes safely train? When can we safely open up our uh, training centers? When can we start having um, competitions? And so I've had a lot of people come forward and ask me about this. Uh, and so based on all of their requests, um, I put together with the help of many individuals, including athletes, executives from national governing bodies, uh, event planners, our high performance team, infectious disease uh, physicians, public health experts, and so on, I created uh, two different documents, um, and one of them is an event planning consideration document, and one is a return to training documents. And so I'll briefly go over those two documents. So one of the first things I did in, in my return to training document is talk about the fact that this document needs to fit sports that are incredibly different. You know, wrestling is, is way different than archery and has a totally different risk associated with it. And if you're in Minot, North Dakota, which is a teeny little town in a state in the northern Midwest part of the United States, there's almost no cases. Whereas if you were in New York City at the time that I put this together, uh, New York City was uh, going crazy with cases. Um, and, and the different national governing bodies have different resources. You know, some have a lot of money and, and can really spend a lot on equipment and facilities and testing and so on, and others don't. And so this had to be able to fit a broad range of sports in a broad uh, range of locations with different risk factors in those locations with very different resources on how to mitigate that risk. So uh, that was part of the preamble. And another part of it is to talk about the ethics. So if you are gonna start having training and you have a bunch of people fly in from a high risk areas to a low risk area, and you bring a bunch of infected individuals into that area, you may have just caused an outbreak. Um, if you cause an outbreak, is there adequate testing for those individuals? If you're gonna test the individuals who are coming into the community, even though they're asymptomatic, are you testing athletes so that they can train and pulling those tests away from people who are sick and in the hospital when we didn't have adequate testing in the United States? And pers personal protective equipment for our physicians um, and medical staff. If you're pulling some of that uh, personal protective equipment to your athletes who are healthy, you know, is that ethically appropriate? And I, and I don't think it is. So I thought, let's put this right out there in the front and tell people, you need to not bring people who are infected into a, an area that you could overburden that area um, and their medical resources. You need to not use personal protective equipment. You need to not pull away uh, COVID-19 tests from people who need it. So all of that was part of the ethical discussion. And then I also talked about the fact that although uh, you know our athletes are relatively young and healthy, without very many comorbidities. Certainly we have athletes who have diabetes and moderate to severe uh, asthma. And if you're looking at your para-athlete population, some have neurologic disease that might compromise their respiratory abilities. Um, they might have uh, uh, an autoimmune disorder that uh, prevents them from fighting infections adequately. And they might be on medications that are immunosuppressive. So 
Absolutely. While we tend to think of athletes as young and healthy, you know, there are comorbidities that might predispose them to having a bad outcome. And uh, not only that, but uh, while most young athletes do well, not all of them do. So even people who are young and healthy can die from this infection. So I put in that preamble uh, until COVID-19 is either eradicated, a vaccine is developed, or a cure is found. There's no way to completely eliminate the risk of fatal infection, and this should always be in the forefront of your mind when planning your training or event. So with that in mind, uh, this is how I set up our return to training recommendations. So I established it into five phase phases that were based on public health uh, guidelines. So phase one is where public health officials are saying, you need to be at home, you need to be not out in the community, um, you need to train on your own, using your own equipment. Uh, at this point, since they can't be out in the community, uh, all of their coaching needs to be done virtually, uh, and they should still do infection control measures, particularly when they go out into the community, like when they're going on a shopping trip or go to the gas station. They need to make sure that they clean their hands, that they're wearing a facial covering, they don't touch their face, you know, all of the standard things. They also need to rigorously keep their living space clean and use appropriate virucidal um, cleaners. Another thing is uh, a lot of athletes live uh, either with loved ones or with roommates, and they may have variable risk. So for instance, if you are, uh, if your significant other or your roommate is a doctor who happens to be an infectious disease doctor working in an ICU that's taking care of a bunch of people who have COVID-19, it doesn't matter if you're sheltering in place if the person you are living with is going to a very high risk environment and then bringing that home. And so really you need to create separation within your own living space. Because as we all know, uh, the highest risk of transmission is living with somebody. I mean, that's, that's what all the studies have, have indicated. So uh, phase two is very similar to phase one, but people are allowed to train it outside at that point. And now you still need some equipment to not share equipment. You need to not touch places that are community uh, exercise locations, like in parks. Um, and you need to do uh, virtual training. So phase three is where the community has um, a significant reduction in the number of their infections. Um, the uh, medical system is not being overwhelmed. Uh, the deaths are continuing to decrease. And so public health authorities say you can start doing things in small groups, but we're not ready for you to open up uh, gyms yet. So in this case, the big thing is, is that while you can train in small groups, you don't want to increase the risk of infection throughout small groups of people. That doesn't help you at all if you can now train in small groups and then the entire group gets sick. So different things that you can do uh, to make sure that the people who are, or actually what I should say is, because you can't be sure, but to do the best you can to try to um, mitigate the risk of having somebody who's infected in that group is number one, uh, make sure that people have not traveled from a location that has a high risk of COVID-19. And frankly, flying right now just puts you at risk because you don't know who you're mingling with on the plane. So you want people to be in the location where those public health restrictions have been loosened because there's a low risk of COVID-19 in that community. And you want people there for 14 days and you want them to be asymptomatic. They should all be doing twice daily uh, sign and symptom monitoring. And before they come into practice, they should be doing a sign and sy symptom check with their coach when they arrive. They should be restricted to travel. If they're traveling, then they need to go through this, uh, you know, self-isolation or quarantine procedure where they're not doing group uh, training anymore. Um, the other option is to do a testing-based protocol. And this is relatively new in the United States strictly because there haven't been enough tests. But essentially, <clears throat> if you give, if somebody comes from a high-risk situation or is traveling, and you give them some time to have an incubation period, and then you test them twice, uh, separated by 24 hours, and they have no symptoms and negative tests, then their likelihood of being sick are very, very low. And the way that we have done this is we've said the first 72 hours, they should just be in isolation or training on their own. And then on days four and five, they get the COVID-19 PCR test, 
Uh, and if those are negative, the likelihood that they are sick is low because that's typically a sufficient incubation time. Although the longer you give them, the more likelihood that you'll uh, avoid a false negative test. We're not using antibody tests because antibody tests really don't tell you much. Somebody can be floridly ill with COVID-19 and have a negative antibody test because they have not had uh, antibody response yet. And even if somebody does have antibodies, we don't know if it means that you're immune. So if you've previously been sick, you've got antibodies, we don't know what that really means other than the fact that you were at some point sick, sick with COVID-19. So it doesn't help you with your clinical decision-making process. So we're not recommending that beyond just for epidemiologic studies. Um, so in phase three, once you have de determined either through a 14-day uh, individual training period in a specific location or a testing protocol and people are asymptomatic, then you can start grouping them into small groups. And what you want to do is have them in the smallest group uh, that you can to have an effective training session and to not change groups on a daily basis, but to essentially create this uh, nucleus of people that are going to train regularly together. And that way, if you had people changing groups at all times, then if somebody was sick, they might infect multiple different groups. Uh, and if you have a larger group, then of course it's going to infect more people. So smallest number of people that you need, that you can have for an effective training program and keeping those same people together at all times. But in this phase, you're still assuming that there's still community transmission going on. That's why they're not allowing the gyms to open. And so if possible, you want people to be a minimum of six feet apart. But, you know, in general, when you're exercising hard and you're breathing hard and you're coughing and, you know, everything else that goes with heavy exertion, there's a lot of respiratory droplets that are being sprayed and they're going further than what would happen with normal, uh, calm, resting respiration. So we're recommending 12 feet. Uh, and that is a guesstimate because there's not specific science on how far it needs to be in an exercising individual. But there's certainly studies uh, that have been coming out or case series that are indicating if you're in tight quarters and you're exercising, a lot of people get infected uh, from that. Um, so we're set recommending even if you're in a small group, try to be separate from people. Uh, you do your standard infection prevention measures with social distancing, hand washing, and so on. At this point, still no direct or indirect contact. So that means use your own equipment. Uh, if you're playing basketball, you have your own basketball, you're doing your shots, you're not sharing a basketball, you're not passing with your neighbor. Same thing with uh, volleyballs. You're not uh, doing direct contact. So wrestling, boxing, judo, uh, taekwondo, any of those types of sports. Um, certainly only drinking out of your own water bottle, eating your own food and so on. And after every training uh, uh, group session, you definitely uh, rigorously clean your equipment. Coaches can be on site now, but they need to be standing separate from the athletes so they don't get sick. And they should be wearing a facial covering at all times. Um, is where you essentially have minimal cases, there are no deaths. And so public facilities are open. Um, they're allowing, um, uh, they're allowing, um, gyms to reopen. So in this case, you want to do the same thing to select your group. You still want people who aren't infected to be in your group. Uh, you still want to do twice daily symptom checking because, you know, unless COVID is gone or we have a vaccine, um, there is still a risk of getting sick. Um, but at this point, you can start doing direct and indirect contact if that is necessary for your training. So if you're a cyclist, you don't have to do direct or indirect contact, but if you're a boxer, you do. Uh, so this is the time that you would start actually boxing with an opponent as opposed to with a heavy bag uh, or a punching bag. Um, but general infection control measures still need to be uh, in place and you still want um, to do uh, use your own equipment when uh, possible and, and do vigorous cleaning protocols. Now, phase five is when a vaccine is developed or there's an effective treatment. And so at that point, there's really no restrictions. But, you know, if there's anything that we need to learn from this is that infection control is super important. And so you should still consider doing appropriate cleaning of your equipment, not sharing water bottles and so on. If somebody is getting sick and you should be doing daily symptom monitoring, regardless of COVID-19, if somebody starts having loose stools, they should not be around 
the other athletes, uh, because, you know, certainly uh, if you have, you know, a, a gastroenteritis that runs through your team that can uh, destroy a competition or a training uh, block. So, you know, infection control measures are still important. So now I'll move on to event planning. So it's somewhat similar in terms of a preamble. I talk about the ethical considerations, the fact that all the, these events are different. But when you're bringing multiple people together from multiple different areas, your risk of transmitting infection and either infecting that community or seeding people that go back to other communities and then get those communities sick is much higher. And so it can have a much larger public health impact. So this is really important when people are starting to think about uh, doing events planning. Um, <clears throat> One of the first things I talk about in the document is financial implications. So when you're planning an event, so a lot of times you buy events insurance, but when something like this happens, um, you know, events insurance companies essentially say, you know what, this is excluded now from the clause. And so if your event is canceled because of COVID-19, you still are on the hook for the financial implications of that. We're not gonna cover it from an insurance standpoint. One of the prime examples of that is when 9-11 happened in the United States and uh, immediately all insurance policies for events excluded terrorist attacks. Uh, so the same thing is happening now with uh, infectious disease uh, on policies. Um, I had a call from one of the national governing bodies saying right now because of COVID-19, the fact that we've had to cancel all of these events um, the fact that we don't have access to training facilities and so on, it's just had a tremendous financial impact on us. And we're going to probably have to lay off a third of our staff. But if we can hold one event in September, then we can hold on to another, you know, two thirds of our staff and not uh, let them go. And if the event goes off as planned, then everything will be good. And I said, well, what happens if the event gets canceled? They said, oh, well, we'd go bankrupt because we paid all of these people for several months in the lead up to that event. And we we're depending on the finances of it. And I said, well, you know, the fact of the matter is, is that none of us can predict what things are going to be like in September, October, November, December. And they may be worse and they may be better. The other thing is, is that a lot of uh, it might look great. And then the week before your event, there's an outbreak in the location of your event. And so the likelihood of cancellation is inherently higher based on our current issues with COVID-19. And so anybody who's planning an event has to think about that before planning the event and anticipate that it will be canceled and plan accordingly. If you cannot handle that financial impact because you have to guarantee room blocks at hotels and you have to pay caterers that you had reserved, and that's going to break you financially don't plan the event cancel it just don't do it the event date uh, not only do you have to kind of look at your uh, crystal ball and try to predict the future about when you can do the event but you have to kind of backtrack how long is it going to take athletes to be able to train to be fit for the event and avoid injury and in addition to that when can athletes start training because right now they can't most of the training facilities are closed down so you kind of have to backtrack, how long is it going to take to train? When can they start training? And then you can target when your event can take place. Uh, you also have to kind of figure out when it's going to be allowed by public health, affair, uh, public health authorities and when the venue will be available. So when you're choosing your event location, you have to look for a region that has a low transmission, the infrastructure to host the event, the medical infrastructure to be able to handle an outbreak if it does happen, you have to be able to mitigate risks in that community, uh, and you have to have a venue that uh, allows for the medical aspects of it. So not only do you want an athlete's medical location and a, um, a spectator uh, medical location, but you have to have quarantine rooms so that you're not mixing people who are suspected of having COVID-19 with those who are not. Then I said that uh, you need to start thinking about what the risk of your particular sport is. and Sports that require close sustained contact obviously are high risk sports and probably are not gonna be as easy to uh, plan and may not be as early to return as those with low risk. So individual sports that don't have any sustained or even intermittent contact. 
And so I created this list of high, low, and moderate risk uh, sports to help people in their planning process. Um, then you need to come up with your medical team. Obviously, this is an incredibly important part of the event planning. You need to have a medical director. And I think it's also important anytime you accept the responsibility of being a medical director for any event is finding out who has decision-making authority to cancel the event. So if you're a marathon director and it is really high humidity and very hot, unseasonably so for the location where you're having that uh, marathon, you should be able to cancel that as opposed to the event planner who's like, well, you know, for financial reasons, I don't think we should. If it's going to be a high risk, you have potential for death, then that event has to be clear authority. I would not sign up to be their medical director. Um, I recommended that everybody who's planning an event read the CDC and WHO mass gathering documents and complete the WHO sports specific mass gathering risk assessment tool. It's a fantastic uh, risk assessment tool. It's a spreadsheet, asks a whole bunch of questions, you know, on a zero to two scale, do you, you know, all these different risk factors. And then it has another page of risk mitigation measures that you can take. And then it gives you a combined score that helps you determine how high of risk your event is. Then you want to work closely with public health authorities because they're going to have the most information uh, for local public health situation and be able to guide you to the right resources uh, as you're planning your uh, event. And then when you're thinking about who's going to come to the event, I recommended setting them into tiers. Tier one are the people that you have to have there. So, you know, your athletes, your judges, you know, your medical personnel, security, anti-doping. Type the, the tier two are people that you'd like to have there, but you don't have to. And that'd be media, um, probably some of your other ancillary services. But tier three are the ones that you really don't need to have there. Again, nice, but absolutely not needed. And those are your spectators and vendors. And then you determine which of those tiers are going to be at your event. And the more tiers you have at your event, the more the complexity of the planning process is. But that being said, you know, you, you can have all three tiers. It just makes it a more complicated plan. Uh, you have to figure out how you're going to screen your participants to make sure that they're not sick. And I already talked about screening, so I'm not going to go into that. Um, you also want to identify individuals who are at risk for a more serious infection or bad outcome and either encourage them not to come to the event or if they're going to come to the event, figure out how you can do further risk mitigation with those individuals. Um, you want to make sure that the right people have personal protective equipment. So obviously your medical personnel, but also your security personnel. And the people who are taking tickets as, uh, as uh, spectators are entering, you know, anybody who's going to have a high number of sustained contacts with people needs to have personal protective equipment. You need to know your medical clinic locations, your access and egress routes for uh, emergency personnel. And you want to figure out how you're going to do social distancing at your um, entrances and exits. Ideally, you want to have your uh, entrance and exit in a different location. You want to have different locations for your athletes, at your tier one staff versus your tier two and tier three staff. Um, it would be really nice to do screening of signs and symptoms and have thermal cameras as people are coming in so that you can identify those that are potentially infected and turn them away at the entrance rather than inside of the venue. And then you want to do your general infection prevention measures, which I'm not going to go into, but you know, hand washing, not touching your face, having posters everywhere, having a communication strategy to educate people in advance, also telling people not to come if they're already sick. But if you identify somebody who is sick, uh, you need to have a plan. So if they're at the entrance, you should turn them back and you should hand them a sheet that tells them these are the local resources, contact these providers, and they'll help you with uh, how to address you know, your potential illness here. If somebody's inside the venue though, you need to have people kind of monitoring the crowd, seeing if somebody's sick, if somebody is sick, pulling them out of the crowd, bringing them to a quarantine area, and then having either an assessment plan in place and or a transportation to a local medical facility plan in place. From a communication strategy, you need to have very good, clear communication with your public health authorities. You need to have good multimodal communication with all stakeholders on infection identification management 
and then also mitigation. And as all of you are probably very aware, well aware, right now there's an incredible amount of anxiety uh, surrounding uh, COVID-19. In fact, in the United States, it's estimated that a third of the population has clinical diagnosis of anxiety or depression related to COVID-19, which is a huge percentage. And if you talk to people about what things you're doing to try to make your events safe, it's going to reduce that anxiety and help them make an educated decision about whether they want to attend that event or not. Now, if somebody does test positive at your event, you have to have a notification process in place to let people know that they may have been potentially exposed to somebody with COVID-19 and how, how to proceed from there. Uh, and after the event, I think it's really nice to have a summary document that essentially goes back through and says, these are the things we did. This is what went right. This is what went wrong. This is what we would recommend in the future so that we can all learn from the process and from each other. So now finally, I'm gonna talk about reopening the Olympic and Paralympic training centers. So we have uh, sort of started working on reversing the process of closing them. And so we're, we're redeveloping cleaning protocols for the housing, dining and training venues, uh, meeting rooms and so on. We're putting thermal scanners in place so that anytime anybody enters or exits the training center, their temperature is going to be taken and all of our uh, security staff are gonna be asking people uh, screening questions anytime they come on or go off site. We're creating plastic partitions between people who are workers at the venues and uh, our athletes. Everybody will have to wear facial cover coverings and so on. Now for the actual athlete entry process, when athletes arrive, we're going to quarantine them uh, and we're going to do that process where for the first three days, they're on their own in a, an isolated room. We're gonna give them some workout equipment. We're gonna give them mental health resources that they can use to help them get through that time frame. On day four and five of that quarantine, we're gonna test them uh, with a PCR, but we're also gonna do a serology test for antibodies, and I'll tell you why in a second. If uh, their PCRs are negative and their serology is negative, then they're gonna be allowed to, really, to leave that quarantine area and they'll be assigned their own room and they'll start training with a small pod of other athletes of the same sport. Um, and they will be able to have close sustained contact with one another if needed, but otherwise we'll continue to do uh, social distancing and, and so on. But the whole reason for doing the testing procedure is to identify people who are sick and exclude them from training. And those who aren't sick, allow them to train unrestricted with each other. Um, if somebody either has a history of COVID-19 that's documented with a positive PCR, or they test positive with a PCR, or they have positive antibodies and just didn't even realize that they had been previously sick, then because of the potential risk for cardiac complications, we have a cardiac screening process in place where we're going to do a high sensitivity troponin and ECG of those athletes. But at the same time, we're also going to do an ECG and high sensitivity troponin on athletes who do not have any history of COVID-19 and all of their tests are negative so that we have a control group and a, sort of an intervention group, those that have had or currently have an infection. And we're going to be able to compare what is the true incidence in the young athletic population of cardiac complications associated with COVID-19? Is there a fairly high incidence of post-viral myocarditis uh, or cardiomyopathy uh, or not? Because right now a quarter of um, patients with COVID-19 that are hospitalized have cardiac complications, but we all know that those people are typically over 65 and they have multiple comorbidities. Um, but at this time, sports cardiologists are recommending screening. So we're going to study that and figure out whether recommended screening is actually appropriate. We're also going to do pulmonary function tests on everybody uh, and uh, assess pulmonary function of those with and without you know, COVID-19 history and see if there's residual lung damage associated with it. So um, <clears throat> as I talked about, we'll allow the athletes to train together. We'll work with their coaches on the training protocols as well as the venue managers um, and our operations group. 
we're going to make sure that uh, when people don't have to have close contact, that they have 12 feet of separation when they are training. We're going to supply them with their own uh, drinks and food so that they don't have to worry about that. They're not going to eat in the cafeteria. They're going to pick up uh, boxed lunches and, and boxed food and take it back to their rooms. We're not going to have steam rooms, saunas, uh, hot tubs, all of that is, you know, showers, locker rooms, they're going to have to do all of that back in their rooms, and that minimizes exposure and risk of uh, transmitting disease. So finally, um, on a research uh, front, we are with the history, the PCRs, and the antibody tests, we're going to uh, figure out what the prevalence of COVID-19 uh, is in elite athletics in the United States. We're gonna be able to separate that by sport, by region of origin where the person was located while uh, all of this was happening. Severity of uh, the disease that they experienced are most of these asymptomatic or did they have mild symptoms or did people have pretty significant symptoms? We're also gonna look at the cardiac dysfunction I talked about before as well as pulmonary dysfunction. So in conclusion, you know, COVID-19 hit the world, but certainly our organization hard and fast. Uh, our response was dynamic, multifaceted, and often was uh, related to the rapidly changing uh, public health regulations that we had to, had to respond to. We implemented a broad infection control strategy uh, as this was all occurring, and we feel that it was quite effective. But we have a really challenging path ahead of not only reopening the training centers, but really from a societal standpoint, reintroducing sport, reintroducing training, reintroducing competition. And as all of us know, uh, exercise is incredibly healthy in numerous ways, not just to be a great athlete, but to reduce cardiovascular disease, pulmonary disease, diabetes, multiple different kinds of cancer, improve sleep pattern, reduce depression. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. I mean, it is truly the magic bullet in terms of the best thing that we can do and prescribe to our population. And so we have to figure this out and be able to provide good advice to our uh, patients and our athletes when they're talking to us about returning to activity. So that is uh, the presentation, and uh, I really appreciate your, your attention. I'm going to stop the screen sharing uh, here, and uh, I am happy to answer any questions that you have. I'll just go to the chat function here. Yeah, or raising your hand. Um, and actually, Jim, if you want to take over now and you can handle the logistics of, yeah. of uh, moderating the questions, and I'm happy Thank to answer Dr. questions. John, that was a very excellent lecture. Thank you so much. Yeah, sure. My pleasure. Very well, uh, very comprehensive, covers a lot of things, and you can also help us uh, from our end to maybe kind of adapt things that you have said. So we have a question from uh, the first person who raised his hand is uh, Bash. Hi. Hi, Dr. Hi, Posh. How thank are you? you? We're doing fine. You're, I'm at the hospital right now. So thank you very much. And I think that it's just very timely that you're currently the Chief Medical Officer of the U.S. Olympics and Paralympic Committee. I think that um, there's really a reason for everything. And your the way that you organize things is just, I think, timely for them. So anyway, my question is, my question is, um, what are your thoughts about athletes receiving some vaccinations like, you know, flu vaccine? Is there actually any role of a certain kind of, let's say, the minimum vaccinations that you'd like them to have? And my next question will be, because I think a lot of people will be asking you, um, what are your thoughts about giving prophylactic treatment, let's say hydroxychloroquine or some other fad that they're having right now about the flu vaccine? Thank you. Yeah, so great questions, Posh. Um, so on vaccinations, certainly we are absolutely recommending standard uh, vaccinations for flu, um, you know, meningococcus and pneumococcus, particularly for those that have had a splenectomy. So sort of your standard uh, uh, vaccines. In addition to that, um, you need to look at the regions where your athletes are traveling. So for instance, in Japan, 
the influenza strains that are present in Japan are very different than in the United States. And so the vaccine that's developed in Japan for you know, seasonal flu is different than the US. So if we did the flu vaccine in the US and then you travel to Japan, you haven't actually improved your uh, immunity. Um, and so you need to make sure that you're using the appropriate vaccines for the location and region that your athletes are traveling to. But absolutely 100%, I think it, it is imperative to make sure that, that your athletes are up to date on their vaccinations. Um, and then your, your second question on prophylactic treatment. You know, at uh, this point, like the data on hydroxychloroquine, it, it actually looks like they have more complications than it actually is beneficial um, because of the cardiac complications associated with it. Um, and so while certain individuals in the United States are, are taking it prophylactically right now, uh, I, if I was their doctor, I would not recommend that, but I don't think that they would actually listen to me. Um, it's, uh, and there are some other, uh, you know, trials that have been somewhat uh, promising in terms of treatments, but none of those have really investigated uh, prophylaxis. And most of them are on uh, fairly new investigational medications that are not as readily available. And so in my opinion, I think that we should be saving uh, the use of those medications for the people who actually need them. So like with hydroxychloroquine, people who have malaria are not getting the treatment that they need because people are using it for prophylaxis on a disease that they may or may not ever get and using a medication that doesn't actually seem to work. So, I mean, that's my opinion on it. I'd say that we're not ready to do any prophylactic treatments and there are only a few uh, promising treatments right now, but nothing that's great. Thank you, Dr. Um, uh, the next would be uh, Dr. Bonifacio, uh, Dr. Jun, Dr. Jun Rafanan. He's our sports, uh, the star of the sports in the Philippines. You know. oh, thank you. I have a question, Dr. Pina. Are there plans of uh, requiring athletes to do undergo uh, PCR testing prior to an event or competition? And um, okay, are there going to be certain guidelines for this once we have to start with some level of competitions like uh, regional or national competitions? Yeah. So there aren't going to be specific, um, you know, kind of overarching guidelines that everybody has to follow. Even what I wrote, uh, while lots and lots of organizations are using them uh, when they're building their template, you know, they're not enforceable and we're not telling people they have to do it. We're just kind of saying this is what we think is, is a good idea. Now, where, where uh, rules and regulations come into effect are with international federations and specific, uh, you know, national and local uh, um, federations. So, for instance, if you're in the Premier Soccer League, they're going to have their specific protocol that you're going to have to follow. The NBA is having their specific protocol that they're going to have to follow. Um, and people are being very creative about how they're doing it. And there's no one right way. So, for instance, right now, the NBA is considering flying all of their teams to Orlando, ha having them all essentially quarantined in a hotel, doing testing on them, not letting them go into the community and having them play in a single arena with the exact same, you know, uh, staff that are there. And those staff are living on site. And so they have a very controlled environment. Now, realistically, for most sports, that's not going to be very, uh, you're just not going to be able to do that. Um, you know, so when I am talking to groups that are advising like uh, little league games, I say, well, right now you need to look at each local community um, and probably not have travel teams initially and have smaller games with local kids. And as things calm down, then starting to, you know, intermingle with communities and then eventually internationally and so on. But if you were running like a boxing match in, in the uh, Philippines, I would probably say, you know, number one, it's a high risk sport. I'd have them come uh, well in advance. I'd have them train in a quarantined environment. 
and I would do testing so that it minimizes the risk of, uh, of transmission. But you have to have enough time from when they arrive and they're doing their quarantine that you actually have an incubation period where the test is going to be positive if they're, if they're developing COVID-19. So that's, that's what I'd recommend. I hope that answered your question. And so yes, it did, it did. And so far, so the International Olympic Committee has not come up yet with any guidelines regarding a comp uh, uh, like um, participating in the uh, in the Olympics not yet yeah so not yet and uh, so all the different sports as they're reintroducing um, you know competition the international federations are determining that but for the Olympics you're absolutely right it will be a combination of the Japanese government the Tokyo Organizing Committee, the Tokyo government, the World Health Organization, and the International Olympic Committee. And those five people will come up with, you know, what the protocol will be. And it'll be interesting to see what happens. I mean, there it's very possible that they'll hold the Olympics without spectators. Um, there probably would be a testing protocol, is my guess. Uh, unless there's a vaccine. And if there's a vaccine and it's readily available and they're able to distribute it across the world and get people vaccinated, you know, that changes things. Um, but the likelihood of that and having it widely available by the time of the Olympics is low. Thank you very and much. It's still possible that they'll cancel the Olympics. And if they yes. do, well, that's just going to be a crushing blow to so many different sports professions around the world. Can Elaine, your turn. Thank you, Dr. John. Yeah. Thank you. Good evening, Dr. John. Hey, Elaine. Hello. It's nice to see you. Well, I share, first and foremost, uh, I share the sentiments of Pashi. It is very timely, and I'm sure there is really a reason from up above why you are in that position right now. Because uh, you were chosen. You're chosen for a good reason. Dr. Elaine, he wants to see your face. <laughs> Because no, I'm in the other, actually, I'm doing a lecture for the medical school in Fatima. I'm on Canvas <laughs> lecture room. <laughs> so that's why I just turned off the other computer. I'm so sorry. Okay, so um, for my question, I've noticed that you mentioned in one of your slides that your quarantine is 10 days. And then your requirement is 72 hours of being asymptomatic. Because here in our country, everywhere you go, every protocol, every city in the Philippines, they're very strict with a quarantine. Whatever is your profession, whatever is the industry, whatever is the business, it's always 14 days. Yeah. So what I was talking about is when somebody's sick. Okay. So it's not waiting for somebody to get sick, um, which is the standard 14 days. The um, If you are sick, then it has to be a minimum of 10 days and then a minimum of 72 hours of asymptomatic time frame. Um, and based on the research at the time that that was published through the Centers for Disease Control, they felt that if you were doing a symptom monitoring program to determine when somebody was not contagious anymore, uh, that was the recommendation. And essentially that equates to 13 days. So it's almost 14 days anyway. Okay. Um, but the, uh, but they were rarely did people actually end up in that, you know, their symptoms typically lasted a little bit longer. Um, and then it took longer for them to be asymptomatic. And so often it was longer than 14 days anyway. So it, it uh, was all about that. But if somebody had, like we had a couple of athletes who had mild symptoms, their, their symptoms lasted two days. And then they were asymptomatic okay. for a prolonged period of time. And uh, that was when tests were not readily available. And so we had a minimum of 10 days from the time of onset of symptoms, and then 72 hours beyond that for symptom resolution. And then they would be allowed to go back into activity. But now it's essentially... You go until they their symptoms have resolved. You wait a minimum of three days, and then you do two tests. And if either of those tests are positive, then you wait another three days at a minimum, and then you retest them again. And if it's positive, you wait another three days, and you just keep going like that until they have negative tests. And when and they have two negative tests, it it has to be two negative swab tests. That's a requirement. Yeah, yeah. So that's what the CDC is saying at this point. 
if you have documented COVID-19 before you can go back, uh, you know, to a workplace or, you know, a fly, uh, you need to have, um, you know, documented uh, lack of virus that you're shedding in your mucus. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that, Dr. Yeah. John. Sure. Thank you. So any more questions? There are a bunch in the um, in the uh, chat area. I can go through some of those. Let's see. Let's see. Uh, what do you think about flu vaccines? We've got that one. They're asking um, to supplement the uh, food or medicine. Uh, any recommendation, Dr. John here? Here's a question here from Hanik. May I ask about supplement, food, or medicine? The yeah, so the, there's no actual good research on specific food or medicine that's going to make a difference for COVID-19. But what there is, uh, is some vitamin D research that indicates that uh, if you have adequate d vitamin D levels, it reduces your risk of upper respiratory infections and also the duration of your symptoms. And so um, we don't know whether that will be the case in COVID-19, um, but it is possible. And so it's reasonable to try. There was one study recently that uh, was, you know, it's not prospective. And so you can't tell causation, um, but it, so it was a cross-sectional study and people who had worse outcomes did have lower vitamin D. But, you know, maybe they also smoked. Uh, so we don't, you know, maybe they were inside. So we don't know whether that was actually the reason that they had less severe disease. Um, but, I, you know, vitamin D, as long as you're doing it in an appropriate manner, is healthy. And so I think that's a very reasonable thing to do. But to my knowledge, there aren't other specific food items that uh, or supplements that have been shown to be a benefit. Yeah, the other question, Dr. Jan here is, does the COVID treatment have an effect on doping guidelines? Yeah, well, I, what I will say that's kind of interesting is that COVID stopped a lot of anti-doping controls. Uh, and so a lot of people began doping because they knew they weren't going to get tested. Um, and this happened around the world. Um, and, you know, testing is not ramped back up. It's still just essential testing. And they've even done stuff where they're trying to do virtual testing, where they're letting people like they ship them a bottle that they have to go to the bathroom in and they try to video it while they're going, you know, which is kind of, I don't think that's a great <laughs> process. Um, and so it's, it's a really crazy time right now from an anti-doping situation you know, and even the delay of the games next year, a bunch of people who had doping bans that wouldn't have been able to compete in the Olympics this year, their bans end and they get to compete in the Olympics next year. So it's, it's kind of a bummer. But from a, you know, the treatment standpoint, you know, you would have to get a therapeutic use exemption for IV steroids if you received those. Um, so there are certain medications and stuff that are intermittently used uh, in combination uh, with other treatment modalities for this, um, but it would be very easy to get a retroactive therapeutic use exemption from the World Anti-Doping Agency and the International Federations uh, for life-saving treatments in, in this case.